Hello, I'm Michael Pierce, and this is The Human Condition. Today we're talking about how does depression affect the brain and behavior. Depression affects the brain and behavior profoundly. First, we must define what is depression and what is depression not. Depression is not feeling sad and feeling down and kind of being morose. It is usually technically defined as a lack of motivation. So it means a lack of drive, a lack of motivation, and an inability to do things or start things or finish things. Now, finishing things and starting things may involve dopamine and GABA, but for our purposes, let's look at just depression and serotonin and the simple model of what we know so far, which is that depression has to do with not being able to initiate and complete tasks. So it's about, it's about this motivation. So psychologists look at it as motivation. I'm not a psychologist, I'm a chiropractic neurologist. So I'm here to talk about the nuts and bolts, the mechanics of, of what goes on in the cells, not so much the counseling, although that's so incredibly important. I'm not against medication when necessary, but I'd sure like to try other things first, or perhaps even work with a psychiatrist and, and work with a prescriber to see if we can get the dose as low as possible, because there are some, I mean, every, every pharmacology textbook says every drug should be reduced to as low as possible and eliminated as soon as possible, because these are not designed to be long-term drugs. If you read pharmacology textbooks, they all tell you that most drugs are not designed to be used long-term. I mean, insulin, sure, but the rest of them, not really, especially psychoactive drugs how depression affects the brain and behavior, people often become more mute. They, they speak less. They move slower sometimes. They physically move less. They often take less care of themselves and, and they may get body odor and wash themselves less. They may take less care of themselves and groom themselves less. They may put on shirts that are sloppier or pay less attention to their grooming and how they look to people. They may pay less attention to their hair, their skin, their teeth, their beard, their body, their accessories, earrings, necklaces. So it's, it's important to understand that a change in behavior is more important in observing depression than just, you know, what does somebody present with? If someone presents to me with no, a, a woman with depression presents to me with no jewelry and no, no hairdo or very little attention to her clothing and shoes, that doesn't mean anything to me because that may be her typical style of dress. But if someone tells me that she goes out every day with high heels, polished shoes, and jewelry, and a very coiffed hairdo, and makeup, and she comes to me and doesn't have any of those things, I'm going to say that's a significant change in that person's behavior. So depression represents a change in behavior, not just how a person presents. It's, it's a change in their prior behavior to how they're behaving now. So there's a, there's a downregulation of their grooming of their cleanliness, of their effort to be social. They often don't engage, they often don't speak, they often don't move. They will be involved less, they'll go to less clubs and less appointments. And so it's hard to catch the depressed person in your family and social group because they just fade away from the radar. So the person that's depressed is hard to detect because they don't have an obvious thing that says, I'm depressed, I'm depressed, I'm depressed. It's much easier to spot the anxious patient, the bipolar friend, the manic friend, or any number of other problems like ADHD or mild traumatic brain injury, post-concussion syndrome. These things are all much easier to spot than depression because pure depression really just makes a person fade away. And sometimes it's a slow process. Depression can be a slow process chemically and electrically, and it can happen after a head injury. It can happen after a toxic poisoning like a mold exposure or heavy metal exposure that's chronic and over time. It can happen with chronic infections, like if a person has bad root canals or periodontitis. It can happen after heart disease. It can happen after heart attacks. It'll happen in, in, in people that are chronically diabetic and they have weight gain and failure to control their blood sugar. That failure to control their blood sugar may lead to a depression because they're failing. Likewise, a failure at work or a failure in a relationship could lead to a person becoming depressed. It could be purely emotional. Failed relationship, a failed job, being divorced, being fired, being investigated for your taxes or, or going through a divorce or testifying in court, having a car accident case. All of these things can lead to depression slowly and they can sneak up on a person and their social network. Depressed people tend not to reach out because they don't have the motivation to reach out for help. So they, they tend to withdraw slowly and they withdraw with inertia. So they don't suddenly pull back usually. They just don't 
do the normal things they used to do, so they can be very hard to spot. And, you know, depression can lead to suicide, so we have to look at, at uh, depression and try to catch it and speak with people and ask them these questions about how they feel. Because a, a depressed person doesn't necessarily feel bad in, in, in a sense, they feel a lack of motivation. And they don't want to get off the couch, they don't want to move, they don't want to cook for themselves. They don't want to clean the dishes and clean the house, they don't want to do their laundry. They don't want to wash their car and clean their car. They don't want to clean their briefcase or their desk. So look at these changes in behavior. Those are the behaviors of depression. And there are interventions of all kinds that we can do that involve natural substances that help balance serotonin and dopamine and GABA and norepinephrine. There are natural diets and foods. We have to look at blood sugar and thyroid. We have to look at the sex hormones and the stress hormones. We've got to look at sleep quality. Every depressed patient needs to look at the sleep quality first. And then we have to ask the simple questions of, do we need more serotonin and do we need an SSRI drug first? Because if we believe what Hippocrates said, which was you know, the father of Western medicine at least, he said we should first do no harm. We should be going from least invasive to most invasive. So if you believe that you've got depression because you have an imbalance in neurotransmitters like serotonin, you should know that serotonin and other neurotransmitters are not stored in your nerve cells. They are so abundant and easy to make and cheap, if you will, metabolically cheap, that we make them on demand. And so because we make them on demand, our body can make them very, very easily. And so we don't even store them in the end plates of our, of our neurons. We don't store them in the synaptic button where we release neurotransmitters. We make them on demand, so they're cheap and easy to make. So we need protein, we need magnesium, we need iron, we need vitamins like B6, B12, and folate. If we don't have those things, we can't manufacture serotonin and other neurotransmitters so we ought to start there before we leap to an invasive and dangerous and side effect laden set of drugs that may even lead people to sometimes go on homicidal missions where they shoot people, they shoot themselves, they shoot other people, and, th and that can be a problem sometimes. So look at depression, look at methods, and understand that depression does affect behavior in ways you might not think of.